we've done three randomized trials, uh, very high rankings of the National Registry of Effective Programs. Uh, and lots of people have used this. And what's been most interesting to me is we've then been able to take these principles and use them in a whole series of interventions in collaboration with many different investigators. We did a randomized trial with African American single parent families in Dorchester. I wrote a book for families. We developed a program with bicultural bilingual human children, for Latino families. We've done large scale collaborations in Finland, Holland, Australia, Costa Rica. Rwanda, South Africa, Chile, for Blackfeet uh, Nation Project Focus is a project with the Navy, uh, working with families with uh, multiple deployments. Uh, big mental health center on the south side of Chicago. We train people from many different mental health centers. Uh, we have an institute we focus on an area that I think is very important. And one of the things we need to think about in terms of mental health is that often people with major mental health issues don't show up in the mental health sector. So if we want to talk about putting just two risk factors together, single parenthood and poverty, and think about young women raising children, single parents in poverty, tremendous risk, rates of depression, uh, more than 50%. And we try to address that in the Head Start Project, but also in the Urban Institute Project, looking at levers under the Affordable Care Act where we can get uh, treatment. Now, in uh, Dorchester, uh, we formed a community organization to do research, found the core. Uh, we then uh, advanced the thesis that in order to do an adaptation, we have to work at the community level, the caregiver level, the family level, and we worked uh, for nine months before we saw any families. We then were able to adapt the intervention and uh, uh, really uh, show that it worked with uh, appropriate changes and attention to language. You don't talk about depression, you talk about the blues that uh, don't go away. There's tremendous interest in resilience. One of the families we worked with, the mother had lost a son in a violent community, violent episode in the, in the neighborhood, and she stopped reading. She was a great leader. She went through this intervention and began to read again, re emerged into uh, uh, being a fully functioning parent again. I think that. The, the argument for the uh, view that I've advanced and many other people have advanced is that when you actually adapt an intervention in a different setting, this adaptation was done by a, a all African American assessors and engineers, then you really transform the intervention. And uh, similarly, uh, one of the other things that we learned when we followed these families over many years, this is from our large randomized trial, is that there's not one understanding of depression. There's a continuous, ongoing, evolving understanding of depression. Healers emerge within families, and we need to understand depression anew, both the children's growth drives the intervention, but what a 16-year-old needs is very different than what a 12-year-old needs, and also because the intervention changes. And we have uh, web-based training and family talk available at family.org. Paul Shaw and his colleagues at South Shore and Health and Honor with Jackie Martin and Tracy Gladstone have been partnering uh, to try to adapt that. I'll say a little more about it we'll talk about it this afternoon. The Family Connections work with Head Start is available at that website. And then we did an adaptation with Latino families, finding a much stronger orientation to family and to the other. But the kinds of separation in immigrant families are different because many, many times key members of the family are in the country of origin. Uh, we also found, particularly where there's an emphasis on kids being in public school and speaking English, that the kids may be more comfortable in English, the parents in Spanish, but we again were able to hold family meetings and um, uh, really connect uh, with these families. And um, one of the things that we added to the intervention was immigration there, because so many uh, of these kids were interested in the immigration process parents have gone through many of them in order to create a better life for their children. And, um, uh, and that had you know, proved centrally. And then I think another thing that happens in the process of adaptation, we had to ask people in all these interventions about depression in the face of uh, adversity, resilience, and what helps in healing. And this came from a focus group with a group of Latino women. This is what they said about what helps people fo uh, focus on COVID. Focusing on the children, visualizations, 
that are future creators, homes, religion, church, community, support groups, helping others, sharing information, focusing on the present, not giving up, alternative medicine, and humor. And I would say these are universals. These don't just apply to how Latino women make it through depression. And that's another thing you can uncover through new evidence and form practice. So um, then from Lloyd Robler about the process of research in cultural adaptation, but I think it also applies very much to evidence-based intervention. Research is made culturally sensitive through continually an open-ended ser open series of substantive and methodological insertions and adaptations designed to mesh a process of inquiry with the cultural characteristics of the group being studied. The insertions and adaptations span the entire research process. Research, therefore, is made culturally sensitive through an incessant, basic, and active preoccupation with the culture of the group being studied and through the process of research. And I would just um, very briefly mention a couple of our, of our other adaptations. When we worked in Head Start, uh, we did this large program, teacher empowerment and training on interested self-reflection and self-understanding. And we did these short papers for parents in Head Start Fest. So they basically asked me to put everything I do about self-reflection on one and a half pages. <laughs> and I would say all this stuff is available through the Head Start website. They really like it. And the thing that's been most widely used <coughs> is the very short papers. Okay. So and so this was about self-reflection, the kinds of things you can think about and uh, keep track of what happens to you and your family, recognize your place in the larger. Uh, picture, plan for your future, keep a journal, and talk with others. We found that in uh, the uh, circle time in Head Start, it was not very well used. We developed a program in which we worked with teachers to read books about powerful emotions, anger, sadness, etc. That's a Tell Me a Story program that's also available on the web. And we found that there were no books about moral depression, so we wrote one uh, called When My Mom Said. And again, just trying to use language to begin to talk about things. And then as we think about evidence-based uh, and evidence-informed practice, I, I think that we don't do cookie cutters. We do collaborations. So I've been working with Paul at South Shore Mental Health now for uh, more than a year, trying to think about what are the kinds of things we came to in Family Talk, which is a preventive intervention to encourage family conversation, would have any relevance or be of any value in, in home therapy, which is an incredibly important part of wraparound. And I think we would say yes, and we were in a way, I think Paul and Jackie will present that this afternoon, but I want to emphasize that this is a very planful, strategic process in which first we did some training, then we assessed it, now we're thinking about how to incorporate in our manual and understanding of in-home therapy, and actually develop web-based uh, training, and I think uh, there again, building relationships, introducing the project, understanding in-home therapy and family talk, meeting the managers, finding that many of you in South Shore are here today. And again, as we began to do this work, we found many resources available from DMH, uh, their guidelines for the implementation of in-home therapy, the Committee on Culturally Informed Best and Promising Practice, chaired by Barry Sarbet and Peter Metz, provided very important guidance. Jack Simons is here. He's written a manual along with colleagues for in-home therapy. The Institute of Medicine is doing a form on implementation that uh, uh, first May April 3rd and 4th, but will be again in, uh, in, in mid-June, trying to think about the best ways to do uh, dissemination. And I think most importantly, with the theme of today's symposium, our own <coughs> conversations so to move towards closure, there are many other evidence-based practices. School interventions, increasing academic functioning, parenting interventions, interventions in life, that can have early in life and have life on positive impacts, similar to evidence-based preventions or evidence-based treatments, effective for depression, anxiety, conflict disorder, or substance abuse. And I think we need to think about how to get them out there. And there's a real debate in the field do we do evidence-based practice as a cookie cutter, or do we find the core principles that can be disseminated? Our work in collaboration suggests that the latter is the most important and useful approach. 
just one example of that, there's a paper by Ben Samberg and from Cleveland in which they look across interventions and find that there's some kernels that are in, present in many different interventions, using verbal praise, peer-to-peer -peer praise, <coughs> using time out, cooperative structured peer praise, self-monitoring, and these are things that we can put into lots of different interventions. And then, if you were to ask me, I think the principles of evidence-based practice are cultural competence, resilience-based, strengthening parenting, having an orienting guiding framework that organizes the work, partnerships with families, adequate infrastructure and for supervision and support, the plan to disseminate a number of interventions, not one, supporting the development of centers of excellence, and measuring outcomes in multiple domains. And I want to highlight, in particular, the need to support staff and caregivers as they try out new things, as they adapt interventions for different uh, settings. There needs to be a shared creation of intervention, the provision of specific identifiable strategies, support for one another, time and space for shared reflection, encouragement to look at systems, successes and failures, and support for other caregivers. And if we were to come to core characteristics of family talk using that model, the core characteristic components are having a successful family consultation, bringing together different points of view, providing psychological education, planning family meeting, follow up, and then there are many different adaptations. And in our work, we would say across the many projects we've done, self understanding and shared understanding, individual and shared narratives, self care and shared support, we can't take care of anyone else can't take care of ourselves, a long-term commitment on both sides, several years at a minute, and shared values, and uh, finally, also the uh, recommendations I've mentioned before, but I think there are challenges as well, which is the medical model is not a very good model, there's a lack, uh, lack of a focus on prevention, families have multiple needs, how should they prioritize, and I also think we don't really understand families very well. Families are changing, there are many different constellations, many different cultures, and it's a process of continually immersing yourself in that kind of understand it. We need to figure out how to interface with other strategies, we need resources for uh, dissemination, and we need uh, support for training and implementation, and I would highlight that I think my partnership with South Shore is probably the value of a really well-functioning uh, care system, which does multiple prevention families and that's home family orientation. And I think that's one of the good models. Uh, certainly in our work, families have become our partners and our guides. We're deeply grateful to them and thank them for their extraordinary courage in confined adversity and for their willingness to co-construct these interventions. And finally, so the IRM is in Washington and I go to these meetings and I get there, I go out for a long walk the night before. And Washington is filled with monuments, just like Boston. Of course, many of the monuments in Boston are about the Civil War, but uh, you know there are lots and lots of items. So I came upon this monument, and uh, I thought it would provide something as we think about um, conversations in how to improve the standard of care in Massachusetts. Came upon a statue of Mahatma Gandhi given by the people of India to the United States. Mahatma Gandhi. I will give you a talisman. Whenever you are in doubt, or when the self becomes too much with you, apply the following test. Recall the face of the poorest and the weakest man you may have seen and ask yourself, <coughs> if you step, if, if the step you contemplate is going to be of any use to him, will he gain anything by it? Will it restore him to control over his own life and destiny? In other words, will it lead to swallow for the hunger and spiritually starving? Then you will find your doubt, your doubts, and yourself melting away. So we need to think about conversations. And thank you very much.